Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Red Room. It's amazing in here. It's very red. Um, thanks for coming and showing up. I know that this is a tough slot. You've probably all had lunch, so we'll probably we'll try to keep things as interesting as possible. Um, in case you didn't know where you are, uh, we're giving a talk on how to manage your reputation in the age of fake news, legal and online tools for the post-truth era. I'm going to start things off with a few quick introductions. My name is Tara Johnson, and I'm owner of a very modest digital design agency in Concord, Massachusetts, called Alchemy3. We specialize in humanizing the online experience by way of smart design, compelling content, and elevated branding. I've also brought my friend and badass attorney, Chris Worcester, of Levine Piro Law, he is an employment lawyer, employment lawyer and master at small business advice and drafting creative contracts, and he also has impeccable taste in friends. <laughs> all right, let's have a little fun. So you all probably heard about this, but recently right-wing pundit and pinnacle of compassion, Ann Coulter, <laughs> got herself into a tizzy when she was unceremoniously switched um, switched her seats on a Delta flight. Her response? Well, she took to Twitter to leave a very negative review of her experience. So apparently moving down a couple of seats was just too much for Ms. Coulter, who had spent a lot of time choosing just the right seat. She also made sure, since she's Ann Coulter, to insult as many people as possible in the process. So Delta responded like a pro. They showed responsive customer service, they stood up for the respect of their passengers, and they absolutely owned her in their tweets responding to hers. So I think the question is, how would you have responded had you been in that situation? Um, so in the dark ages, before the gloriousness of the internet was born, people, brands, and companies could control what was being said about their brand. So if you were a big wig with big bucks, you could manage the trajectory of your image, you could interrupt your consumers and carefully craft your identity along the way. But now, anyone with a computer can make their voice heard. The internet can be a fantastic place, and in certain ways, it's leveled the playing field. We all have the potential to reach millions of viewers and have great success from the comfort of our homes and from behind our laptops and handheld devices. But you do have to play smart, strategize, and have an awareness of the online landscape. So the internet is your new first impression. Clients are Googling you when they first make contact, and following up on references is becoming something of the past. Who needs to talk to a human when you have the Google? So here are some quick stats. Um, I'm sure you're aware of most of these, but 84% of online consumers say that reviews influence their final purchase. 77% of recruiters use search engines to search to research applicants and 81% of millennials Google their date before going out. So what is online reputation management and what does it entail? ORM includes the following. Anything said about you or your business online. What other, it also includes what others, other sites and forums and online reviews are saying as well. And it also includes how you respond to comments, reviews, or social media conversation. In a nutshell, your online reputation is what's being said the moment you leave a room. Now, as a side note, I've personally had a lot of conversations with clients about their reluctance to engage with social media. I'm not sure if you guys have also had this experience. Um, my company, Alchemy3, is on the outskirts of Boston, and I work with a number of solopreneurs and sole practitioners that rely heavily on word of mouth referrals which are the best kinds of referrals, right? Those are great. But I've had so many conversations with people who claim that social media and having an online presence isn't for them. There is a lot of people under the impression that by engaging with the internet and social media, they're putting themselves at risk of negative attention and potential disaster. But unless you're living under a rock or off the grid in the Alaskan wilderness, you have an online reputation whether you like it or not particularly if you're running a business. It's like saying, I'm not going to leave the house to ensure nothing bad ever happens. 
but you could die from a heart attack or carbon monoxide poisoning or a meteor could fall on your house. So being online isn't bad, you just need to be preemptive and active and you need to acknowledge that reputation and own it. So where to start? Um, a quick note here, I'm gonna give a URL for these resources at the end, so there's no need for frantic note taking. Um, first thing out the gate, claim your business or your client's business on all social media social sharing sites that make sense for you. A great resource worth checking out is knowem.com, that's K-N-O-W-E-M.com. Two, research your competitors and see what they're up to. Figure out what they're doing that works and what doesn't and how you can differentiate yourself. Three, set up Google Alerts. You can establish alerts for certain keywords that apply to you and your business and you'll get an email each time something positive or negative pops up. Four, create a robust social media policy. This is where you might cover things like setting standards for employee use, how you plan to establish consistency across all social channels, um, pinpointing engagement procedures, and defining your online etiquette. And five, make sure that you and or your client has an employee handbook reiterating social media practices. Chris is gonna talk a bit more about this later on. There are essentially two parts to online reputation management. First is your online activity and engagement. Secondly is the monitorization of your online reputation. So when it comes to managing your online reputation, positive content is your most powerful weapon. The more positive, helpful, and authoritative content there is about you and your business, the more leverage you have is if disaster were to strike. It's also just good business. Right? You're building your brand and you're engaging with your audience. These activities include blogging, social media, video, reviews, and participating in online forums. Blogging. You all know about blogging. The idea here is to build trust, share your expertise, be helpful, and establish some authority within your industry. You want people to know that you're human with unique thoughts and that you're worth the effort of making a connection. Once this content is created, squeeze as much out of it as you can and send it to all social channels. And don't be afraid to repost these articles on a regular basis. Social media, you all know this, um, but it's the consistency and thoughtful strategy within the social space that often gets overlooked. Make sure the content is being shared on a schedule and that someone is always fielding comments, inquiries, and engagement from your fan base. And don't just talk about yourself. Nobody likes a narcissist. Video content. For some, writing blog content is akin to water torture. Leveraging video is a great way to share your thoughts, share quick tips, or teach a skill. You don't need to be fancy. An iPhone will often do the trick. So um, here's online reviews. If you have a storefront and you're selling products or services, you need to have a presence on sites like Yelp and Google Business. Remember these reviews will also pop up in Google searches and help differentiate you from your competition. The idea here is that you should be able to outrank search results with your own assets if a competitor or a hater sponsors a nasty review about you or your business. Monitoring your brand. A quick caveat here, um, there are loads of reputation monitoring tools out there, but I'm gonna concentrate on the free stuff because free stuff is awesome. Um, first, you wanna get in the habit of monitoring your brand at least once a week. So set a reminder and work it into your schedule. If you don't wanna do it, which I never do, set a reminder and work it into your schedule. And I think I already said that. If you don't want to do it, set up a task list in Asana, Basecamp, Teamwork, or Google Docs, whatever, and assign it to a team member or virtual assistant if you have one of those. Um, here are the goods. Google Alerts, which I've already mentioned. This tool allows you to receive emails when you and your company are mentioned on the web. You can also keep an eye on the competition with this tool as well. There is a tool called Complaint Search Box by GoFish Digital. 
This website performs a specialized Google search on over 40 complaint websites. It's a quick and easy way to perform free daily searches to make sure customers aren't having negative experiences with you or your brand. ImageRadar.com. This is an image-specific monitoring tool. It helps brands receive credit for their imagery, which increases reach, boosts authority and SEO rankings, and also helps artists and photographers prevent copyright infringement. Socialmention.com and Ranker.com. These are free tools for searching blogs, images, video, and the internet at large for mentions. You can also set up alerts and RSS feeds for specific search terms. This enables you to keep up with, your, with engagement and keep an eye on potential leads. Most important of all, Google yourself. See where you or your business ranks, not just on the first page, but the first 10. I know this might feel a little skeezy and a little bit vain, but if you happen upon negative sentiment, <clears throat> excuse me, or your company shares a name with another company that's getting bad press, you'll want to know where you stand and if you need to adjust your strategy, or worse, begin to plan damage control. So think of it this way. If you get a lazy, if you get lazy or neglectful about this stuff, it's not much different than getting a bad tattoo. It's infinitely better to do your homework first and get it done right the first time as opposed to removing it or covering it up later. Google is not only slow, but damn near permanent. So what about negative online reviews? This is one of the scariest parts of owning a business because you're now inviting criticism. <clears throat> Anyone can hop on Yelp, TripAdvisor, Facebook, or Google and leave a scathing review. Plus, we all know that when people get behind their computer, the claws come out and it can get ugly really fast. But here's the interesting thing. When consumers resort to third-party review sites, they aren't necessarily looking for the perfect provider. A negative or critical review serves as a counterbalance and gives your business the ability to respond quickly and respectfully. In fact, by engaging with your unhappy customer, you now have a chance to address their pain points, prove to them that you're really listening, and win this customer back in a public forum. Also, think about when you've gone to check out a provider, and all you see are five-star rave reviews. Don't you start to question the truthfulness of the content and its origin? As it turns out, consumers prefer mildly flawed businesses as opposed to squeaky clean, possibly untruthful ones. And let's not forget, feedback is valuable. And the more you're able to respond and over-deliver to your customers, the more your business will thrive and grow. So here are a few quick review tips. One, always admit when you're wrong and apologize if necessary. This humanizes your brand and has the potential to strengthen the connection you have with your customers. Two, respond quickly to all comments, whether they're great, lukewarm, or terrible. Your customers want to know that you're listening and that you care about what they think. But remember to be calm and respectful. If you're pissed off, please wait at least 24 hours because anything you say on the internet can be permanent and do some long-lasting and possibly fatal damage to your reputation. And three, a great way to begin fostering an influx of reviews is to get in the habit of asking. Once you sell a product online, for instance, send out a personal email checking in with the customer and ask for a review. If you're a web designer or you run an agency, send this email out at the end of a completed project and make it a no-brainer for them. Include direct links to all of your review profiles. You can also ask them if they are accepting refer referrals. This way they recognize that you're a team player and you're looking out for them as well. So let's get into fake news. <clears throat> this is where we take a glimpse into the dark side of the internet, abuse of authority and viral content. Who knew there was such a thing as fake news until this recent election? We now live in a place where the leader of the free world can cry fake news every time he's criticized or portrayed in an unsavory way. 
We all know that this is dangerous behavior, but has now become mainstream and quite honestly validated. When this untruthful and combative approach becomes commonplace online, we all need to be on guard for ourselves, our businesses, and our clients. Because sometimes all it can take is a single tweet, one pissed off customer, or one vengeful ex-boyfriend or girlfriend to set your reputation into a tailspin. So now for my favorite part, social media fails. There are some examples, um, these are a few examples of how social media can go terribly wrong from just a single misfired tweet or a half-baked social campaign. So there is a snack company in the UK called Walker's Crisps. This company launched a social media campaign asking fans to tweet a selfie using the hashtag Walker's Wave for a chance to win soccer tickets. The company turned the selfie submissions into a video featuring a former soccer player holding up the images in front of the stadium. However, the company didn't properly vet the selfie submissions and the images of serial killers, sex offenders, dictators, and more appeared. Though this was a pretty impressive mishap, Walkers did take to social media to apologize to their fans. Next up, we have McDonald's. <coughs> With what the company attributed to the work of a hacker, McDonald's sent out a tweet to its 150,000 plus followers that bashed President Donald Trump, calling him disgusting, pointing out his tiny hands, and wishing Barack Obama was back in office. The tweet lived on McDonald's Twitter page for a solid 30 minutes before being removed, and the company addressed the mishap in a tweet. Worst of all, they likely lost one of their most loyal customers. I'm going to pass this off to Chris now. So um, let's say you didn't come to this presentation. You had no idea how to deal with negative reviews. Or maybe you've tried some of these tools and they weren't working. So what tools are available to you in the legal realm to deal with online trash talking about your business? So here's a cool example. Um, some of you might have read about this. but. In the last um, few months, Chobani was the victim of fake news. So Chobani's main factory in the United States is in a really small town in Idaho. And the CEO of Chobani is a really badass um, immigrant, and he employs a lot of refugees to kind of give back. Um, I thought they're in New York State. Nope, they're in Idaho. Okay. Um, and apparently also in this town or in, the, in a nearby town in Idaho, there was a rash of crime. So this dude named Alex Jones, who's a total right-wing conspiracy theorist nut job um, and runs this site called InfoWars invented the headline, Idaho yogurt, yogurt maker caught imp importing migrant rapists, because of course that's what you would think. Um, the reaction was of course a, a boy tag, a boy tag. That's a combination of a boycott and a hashtag on Twitter. Um, it was, it's a Twitter boycott campaign. But the result was that Chobani sued Alex Jones and Infowars for defamation because what they said was verifiably false. And that ended in a settlement, which was a win for Chobani. So what is defamation? That's the legal term for trash talking, basically. So if somebody says or writes something about you that is not true and that harms you in some way, and maybe it harms your business or your reputation, that's defamation. It encompasses both libel, which is printed, and that's what we're concerned about in the online space, and it also um, encompasses slander, which is spoken defamation. Um, so if you wanted to sue somebody for defamation, you certainly could, and I would be happy to help you do that, but there's a lot of practical barriers to defamation lawsuits. So the first one is who do you sue? So always when you're, when you're going into litigation, you want to think about does the person you're suing have any money to give you? Because that's really what it's about. I hate to say that, but that's most of the time what this is about. Because if you've lost business, you need to recover that business back. Um, but the, the guys with the big bucks are untouchable. So um, Yelp, WordPress, Amazon, Angie's List, etc., are all immune from liability for this type of lawsuit under the Communications Decency Act. And you'll actually find that cited in WordPress policies. Um, so you actually have to sue the author of the review, which brings up the question, are there any, is there any money available for you to recover? And also, what about anonymity? Because a lot of people are posting now anonymously, so what do you do? So we'll talk about that piece later. 
Um, more practical problems. There's also problems of proof. So how do you put a value on your reputation? That's really hard to do. It's hard to put a number on that. And also, how do you calculate lost business due to the defamation? So maybe your business just took a downturn for some other reason. How do you tie it to the defamation? You can also recover for emotional distress for defamation, but having a stressful day dealing with a negative review is not the same as emotional distress. Also, litigation basically sucks for everybody but me because it's really expensive. It takes a really, really long time. So we're talking two, three, four, five years. You have no guarantee that you're going to win at the other end, even if you have a strong case and human error. Do you really want a jury of your peers deciding your fate? <coughs> um, if you heard all those barriers and you still want to proceed with defamation, uh, defamation lawsuit, this is what you would have to prove. So you have to prove publication of a, of a statement about you. This is pretty easy in the online review context because it's going to be on some kind of site like Yelp or whatever where your business is already identified. Um, but that's, it's not always easy um, in other contexts. The statement has to be false. So I'll talk about this more in a little bit, but opinion is not enough. It has to be a false statement of fact. There has to be some level of fault as to the truthfulness of that statement, which depends on, the level of fault depends on whether you're a public figure or not. Um, I don't know any of you, but I'm pretty sure none of you are public figures. Um, basically, you like you're a celebrity or somebody who's in the news or something like that. Um, and there has to be some type of harm, so lost business, damage to your reputation, emotional distress. And just to make it clear, defamation is not protected by the First Amendment. So you, you have a First Amendment right to speak and say anything you want, but you don't have a First Amendment right to defame somebody by putting out false statements about that person. So if you wanted to go after somebody for defamation, the first thing you should do, you know, you should use terrorist tools, respond to them, ask questions, what can I do to help you? If that doesn't work, you could ask them to remove it. If that doesn't work, you need, then you need to contact a lawyer. The lawyer will probably send a cease and desist letter, which is just a letter asking or demanding somebody take something down. And you're going to want to emphasize factual assertions over opinions. So a few examples. Um, this is actually a super important case in this area of the law. It's called Hassel v. Bird. It's pending before the California Supreme Court right now. Um, it actually ironically involves a negative review about a lawyer. So this guy, this lawyer worked with this woman on a personal injury case for just a few weeks. Um, and she, I, they parted ways for one reason or another. And then she went online and and wrote that he had made a bad situation worse, that he had failed to speak with her, he was unresponsive, and he didn't talk to her insurance company, yada, yada, yada. He asked her to remove it. Not only did she not remove it, she went and wrote another negative review on, um, on Yelp. So um, he won, he didn't, she didn't respond to the lawsuit, and he won over half a million dollars in damages. So just a word to the wise, if you get sued for defamation, you should respond. So you don't want to get a half a million dollar judgment against you. The interesting thing in this case is that Yelp was ordered to take down the reviews. Yelp is not a party to this lawsuit, but the court ordered them to take down the reviews because they were defamatory. So Yelp is not happy about this um, because they're arguing that it's an opinion website. People should be able to express their opinions. Um, but the court said, yeah, but it's defamatory, and we're the ones who get to decide that. So the actual, like, uh, the, the resolution of this case is, is still anybody's guess, because like I said, it's pending before the California Supreme Court right now. I think they've actually had hearings on it, but no decision. So we'll see what happens there. Another example, Dietz versus Perez, it's, in, it's a Virginia case. Um, this was with regards to a home construction contractor. He did a job for um, a homeowner. They parted ways in the middle of the job. And she went on Yelp and Angie's list and said that he had done a bad job, Build her for work he didn't perform and may have stolen her jewelry. So he did something good. He responded to the review on the review site, but he also did something bad because in his response he said that because she hadn't paid him for the work he had done, she basically stole his goods and services. So he also sued her, um, and she. But the, the jury found that he had yes, she had defamed him, but in his response he had defamed her. So they canceled each other out, and he didn't win any money. So the lesson here is, if you're going to respond, don't be a jerk. So take Tara's advice and engage thoughtfully, but don't defame your customer if you're going to respond to their negative review. 
So the reason that defamation cases are difficult is because they come down to this distinction. What's a fact and what's opinion, an opinion? The tests for this that courts use are different around the country, but they, some of the common things are, is the statement capable of objective verification? And also, what's the context or setting of the statement? So a court's more likely to find an opinion when we are talking about Yelp or something like that, where the whole point of that website is for people to give their opinions. Um, so there is, there's one case called um, Bentley Reserve versus Papaleo Leos, where the court said some of the review was um, fact and some was a, an opinion. So the opinion, it was a guy, somebody was writing a, a review about his landlord and trashing the landlord and said that he was a sociopathic narcissist and his terrible you know, service had led to the deaths of three tenants. So the first part was found to be an opinion, sociopathic nar narcissist. Frankly, I think you should be able to verify that. But um, the second part was defamatory because the court found it was a statement of fact that he had led to the death of three tenants. So this is a problem. So what the heck is a fact anymore? We have a president who traffics in conspiracy theories and then labels as fake legitimate news organizations that report verifiable facts portraying him in a negative light. And we have his agents out there saying there's such a thing as alternative facts. There are no such thing as alternative facts. There's facts and you're wrong. So, but with this type of atmosphere, the courts are already engaging in a really nuanced analysis of what's a fact and what's an opinion. And this is gonna make it even more nuanced and more unpredictable. So it's maybe not the best idea to pursue this type of remedy. What about anonymous reviews? So um, anonymous speech is protected by the First Amendment. So you don't lose your right to speak freely just because you do it anonymously. This has been um, <coughs> repeatedly upheld by court after court. Um, but what, what about unmasking an anonymous poster? So this is like we were talking about before, where somebody has written a review of you, you don't know who it is, and you want to respond or have it taken down, but what do you do? So in this case, Yelp versus Hadid carpet cleaning, somebody wrote a negative review of this carpet cleaning service. They actually took it really seriously, and they looked back through all of their customers and all of their jobs, and they tried to match up the facts with, of this review with all of their customers, and they couldn't do it. They couldn't find the match, so they determined that it was a fake review. And in that circumstance, the court said, we're going to unmask this person, and we're going to order Yelp to tell you who wrote this review, because although anonymous speech is protected by the First Amendment, defamatory speech isn't, and the fact that they couldn't match it meant that the review was false and therefore defamatory. Another, so if you guys either have employees or have clients that have employees, you should definitely make sure that they have a social media policy. So this could be incorporated into their employee handbook or it could be a standalone thing, um, and it kind of just governs behavior of the employees on social media. So something to keep in mind, there's a lot of things legally that you can do it yourself. This is not one of them. I don't know why, but the, the body that, um, that reviews these types of policies, which is called the National Labor Relations Board, has a total B in its bonnet, I can't believe I used that expression, <laughs> about social media policies. They are totally obsessed with them. They strike them down all the time. Um, so you would love to be able to tell your employees or your clients would love to be able to tell their employees that you are prohibited from saying anything negative about the business on social media. You can't do that. Um, it just, I forgot that there's something online called policytool.net where you go in and like put all these things in and it spits out a policy. Don't use that because it will spit out a policy that does not comply with NLRB decisions. So it's a bad idea. So in a social media policy, here's what you should put in and not put in. You should put in which account does it apply to. Does it only apply to Facebook? Or does it apply to Facebook, Instagram, um, what do you call it, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera? Who can post? So who can post on behalf of the company? This is really important. You should really limit it to you know, one or two people that have manager roles in the company so that no, but every, all the employees aren't there, out there posting willy-nilly. You should explain why there's a policy. So you're not just being a dick by telling people to comply by these rules. You're trying to protect confidentiality of your business. You're trying to protect your reputation, etc. You should address whether employees can connect with each other on social media or also um, connect with your clients. So like for Tara, it's probably a really good idea for her to connect with her clients on, on Facebook and, and whatnot. But I have a client who's a daycare and they ban their um, employees from connecting with their client parents because there's a lot of confidential information with regards to children. 
You should address compliance with intellectual property laws. My mouth is really dry, so I'm going to get some water. Um, here's, this is the hard part. So like I said, you'd like to be able to you know, control what people say online and, and stop them from saying negative things about the business. You can't do that. What you need to do is prohibit discriminatory, harassing, or threatening remarks, or cyberbullying. And you want to link that back to your employee handbook. So those things should be really clearly defined in your handbook. So that people have no question about what is discriminatory, what's harassing, etc. Um, tell them to be professional with your customers. Um, compliance with confidentiality. Again, the NLRB has a um, has a rule of B in its bonnet about confidentiality. So, in these types of policies, you can't just say everything is confidential. So, a, a conversation that Tara and I have about one of her clients or whatever can't be confidential um, in this policy. It has to be really clearly defined to like trade secrets, intellectual property, strategic plans, business plans, stuff like that. So you just, you really need to spell it out. Like I said, reference your handbook and also a savings clause. So you want to put in language that says, this policy will be applied in a manner consistent with NLRB decisions. What not to in include? I've touched on this multiple times. You can't include a blanket prohibition on posts that reflect negatively on the company. So example number one, excuse me. Let's say one of you know your client's employees posted this my, on Facebook. My coworkers are so rude. They always talk about our customers behind their backs. You can't stop somebody from saying that. You would like to be able to do that, but you can't. The second example, and this is clearly written about me, my boss is such a sissy. He is so thirsty when male customers come into the store. So you can prohibit somebody from saying that because you could say no discriminatory or harassing posts. You would link that to your employee handbook, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of protected classes like somebody's sexual orientation. And so you could fire somebody for posting something like that. Does that distinction make sense? So it has to really tie into some type of policy. Um, so that's it. So we have some time for questions. This web address has a bunch of resources, some of the links that Tara talked about. Um, I also, so for anybody that came here and wants a social media policy, give me a call. Uh, we'll do a free consult and I'll give you a policy for super cheap. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other questions if you give me a call or shoot me an email. Questions? Um, oh, yeah. Just, okay. um, is the NRL? I just hang on. Sorry. Can you just hear me, everyone? Yeah. 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 Is the NRLB something that's now uh, in the hands of the federal government's crazy decision making? Yes, that's policy? a great question, actually. So the question was, is the NLRB, which is the National Labor Relations Board, something that's it now in the hands of our crazy government? I agree with your your assessment of the government, obviously. Slanderous, but I don't care. <laughs> I think it's a verifiable assertion of fact, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, um, the a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, there was a little headline about Trump or his, and his guys having um, put some new people on the NLRB. So some of these policies could change. You, you really don't know. Like I said, they've been striking down all of these social media policies because they want people to be able to say what they what they want to on social media. I personally actually don't agree with that. I think you should be able to restrict your, your employees a little bit more than they have been saying. But yeah, we can we can probably reasonably guess that these things will change over the next few years as more conservative um, reviewers are looking at it. I have a very specific question for Tara. Okay. I want to be able to send my clients a link to my Google Plus page where they can give me a uh, recommendation. Yes. And I can't figure out how to get where that link is. I can get I can get to my page, but I don't know how to send them to my review. Page. I was just looking into that. Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, how do you send your customers a direct link to your Google Plus uh, review page? And I'm actually in the process of setting that up myself. I um, made a note to myself, and I can share that with you. In fact, I can add that to this resources page for everyone. I don't have any. I'm not going to take the time to explain it right now, but I have the answer. Okay. okay? <laughs> it's not simple. I'm not really stupid. No, I think people have had a lot of trouble with that, actually. So I'm pretty sure I found a solution. Great, thank you. Hi. Um, regarding um, negative comments on Yelp or whatever, so when I look on Yelp, sometimes you see critical reviews of a hotel or a restaurant. Sometimes 
the restaurant or hotel, they'll have the same generic response regarding, regardless of what the complaint is, thank you for contacting us, we'll review it. It seems very disingenuous, mm -hmm. but then um, listening to your presentation, maybe there's a policy that they have to use the same generic response, but a as a user, it, it just comes off as very disingenuous. I bet they're know. being really lazy. Right, they're being very lazy. My, I think they probably have an auto responder or something, like some sort of canned response right. that's there. And I think that is disingenuous. I mean, they're technically doing what they're supposed to do, but I think it's pretty lazy. Um, so I hear you and I feel the same way. So my that wouldn't actually be my recommendation if they were a client of mine. Um, so... I'm with you. I wouldn't just respond with the same comment every time, personally. Thanks. Um, I have a client who is a doctor, um, and they just started a brand new baby practice, and he's excellent, and um, he does pain management. So there was a patient he had to stop giving medication to because she was selling them, and she wrote a Because she was what? Selling it. Oh, oh God. Okay. Um, and she wrote a scathing, horrible review on every single thing oh, that ever had him listed on it. Uh, and it's, it's actually visibly hurting things. Okay. How, he's not going to sue her. She's, there's nothing, you know, how do we, how do we combat that? Um, is there any other way to get rid of it? Okay. Yeah, so the problem with this is that he can't respond as much because he's bound by confidentiality. This right. is the problem for lawyers, too. We can't respond in the same way that most of you guys would be able to respond. Um, in that case, you might want to talk to a lawyer. He doesn't have to sue somebody for defamation. He could send a cease and desist letter. I'm guessing if she's selling the medication, she's probably not going to respond to it. But in the meantime, um, I think that there should be some online reputation management happening in the background. I mean, that's absolutely a case of kind of going into damage control mode ramping up blog posts, um, making sure that his positive assets can then push down those negative comments in search results. I mean, I there needs to be some sort of initiated damage control, sort of. And I, I'm happy to talk to you more about that if yeah, you're curious. I that. Okay, Thanks. great, yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm interested in what might qualify as cyberbullying. What does... Uh, like an angry, heated discussion go from uh, just that to cyberbullying? What is there threats need to be involved or consequences suggested? That's actually a really good question. Um, there's not really a great answer for that. It's going to depend on what's in your handbook. So um, bullying, they, I think they're working on changing this actually in Massachusetts, but in most con most of the time in Massachusetts, bullying is really only legally defined with respect to what happens in school. So some employers are borrowing that type of definition um, for implementation at their place, but there's there's not really a separate you know cause of action or, or separate law that outlaws that type of behavior in a workplace. So it's kind of a gray area right now. You would want to, I always put it in my clients' employee handbooks, it's extra than what's, um, what needs to be in a handbook, but I think it should be in there. So, I, and I can't even recall the language off the top of my head, but it, it goes to like threatening and um, repeated, you know, there has to be some sort of repetition to it. Harassment. Yeah. Is it state defined? Is it state defined? So, like I said, the, the, the only piece, as far as I know, that's state defined right now is with respect to what happens in public schools. And I'm actually not sure off the top of my head what the definition of that is in the public school context. But things like discrimination and harassment are both uh, happen on both are are defined on both a state and federal level. So there's a little bit of like a disconnect there. So uh, two questions: um, when it when it comes to these cases, is it determined by state law or is it federal? And then second, I mean, given that the internet is so international. Uh, I understand, for example, the United Kingdom has different laws on, on libel and, and slander. Uh, how does that play into it as to where the person is or where the server is located? Great question. So, well, defamation is state law. It, it can, so each state might define it a little bit differently, like where I was talking about the, what the difference 
is between a fact and opinion. If you read decisions from like Utah versus decisions here, they apply a little bit different test. So, but the elements that I mentioned are, the, are really common to no matter where in the country you're, you're suing. It, it can touch on federal law, so like that Communications Decency Act um, that bars people from suing uh, internet service providers and other people like that. So it, can't, it might butt up against a federal law in some cases. What you're asking about is something called personal jurisdiction, and that's does a court in a particular location have power over the would-be defendant? And that's a super complicated answer. Um, with internet stuff, the, the answer sometimes comes down, well, a lot of times it has to do with does the person purposefully avail themselves of anything in the forum state? So if you were suing some internet company in California, you would want to say, does the person do business in Massachusetts? If the answer is no, you can't sue them in Massachusetts. Um, unless, yeah, there's always exceptions because we're lawyers, but um, yeah, so the other piece with internet is having a continuously available website that you know everybody does now that's accessible around the world can open you up to being sued anywhere, but you really need a little bit more than that. I think we're out of time, so thank you very much.